Right now we just completed the dive to Challenger D. And the submersible needs some more spare parts and they are all custom made, so they will take time to build. So we're not able to dive the submersible at this point. But what we do have is our three full ocean depth landers and the sonar and the science team coming aboard. So they can do the majority of the science that we typically do by using the landers. So I'll be leaving the ship and putting it into the good hands of my chief scientist, Dr. Alan Jameson. I am Dr. Alan Jameson. I am a Hadal scientist, which Hadal means anything deep in the 6,000 meters. I study biology, I work a lot with technology. Me and my research group are primarily involved in trenches in the very deep end of the ocean. The Mariana is a weird one because it's the one that everybody knows and it's, it's prestigious because it's the deepest place in the world. But as a result, all the expeditions that have gone on in the last 40 years always seem to congregate around the deepest point. We're still looking at another 2,000 kilometers worth of Mariana Trench that has gone completely unexplored because of the tendency to, to be drawn towards that prestigious area. We're going to be visiting first the Saipan Deep, then we're going to visit the Tinian Deep, and then we're going to visit the Rota Deep and finish off in what's called the Nero Deep. And the idea is we want to look at scavenging fauna, fish, shrimp, all the animals we don't really truly understand because another weird thing about the Mariana is we know loads about the geophysics and the subduction process, the big physical processes that are happening. We also know loads and loads and loads about the microbiology and the bacteria and the molecular level stuff. So we know everything about the tiny stuff and everything about the huge stuff, but not that much in between. So we're going to use the landers to try and address that gap in our knowledge of the Mariana Trench. This type of work is really important because when you think about planet Earth, most of planet Earth is 4,000 meters underwater. It's not a case of most of planet Earth is ocean. Most of planet Earth is actually 4,000 meters deep. It's, it's deep sea, it's a deep sea planet. Uh, and just because humans don't necessarily feel that they directly interact with that environment doesn't mean to say it's not important. It is most of the planet. Now, the way I've always seen it is if you want to truly understand the ocean, you don't just concentrate on the surface because it's easy. You don't just concentrate on the bit you can dive to and film in a GoPro. You don't just do the bit where you can fish. It's, the ocean doesn't recognize these convenient layers which we assign to what's shallow, what's deep, what's important, what's not important. It's one big huge body of water and someone's got to do the deep end. So that's what we do. My name is Kate von Kruzenstern and I'm an ocean mapper. And so here out on the Ring of Fire expedition for Caledon Oceanic, I am running the multi-beam sonars, creating maps and coordinating with the different scientists on the, in the bridge about dive points and where we're gonna go. The thing with mapping the seafloor is it is the baseline for almost every other aspect of ocean science. And it gives us an idea of the underlying geology, the underlying geomorphology, and how that might dictate other physical processes within the ocean, whether it's chemical, biological, and physical. Without having a great ocean map, you just don't know where to go, and you might not know what's out there. We traveled about 480 nautical miles to the first site, which took about two days. So we have three landers on board and they're called SCAF, CLOSP and FLARE and what landers are are a sort of package of scientific instruments which are all pre-programmed on the surface. So there are various scientific instruments on the landers and the, the first is the CDT. CDT stands for conductivity, temperature, depth. Uh, conductivity is where we derive salinity from so it essentially measures the depth, the temperature and the salinity. The lander also has a 10 litre what's called a Niskin bottle which is a, a a device that collects 10 litres of bottom water and brings it back to the surface. The landers also have HD video cameras on them and with uh, each has its own light as well and they are focused on bait which we use macro about a metre in front of the camera and that's our field of view. Each lander also has two funnel traps which are very simple uh, cylindrical baited traps that are, are very quite primitive and those are used to collect small crustaceans off the seafloor. For those who don't know, there are, the Mariana Trench is technically five areas. So what we're trying to do is get samples from in between each one, and you look at these populations that have been isolated by seamounts as they get pulled in. None of these particular deeps have names. We've decided to call them Saipan, Tinian and Rota after the, the three inhabited islands 
adjacent to them on the west. So tonight, we'll start on the Saipan one, which is the most northern one, and we'll start at the shallow end and put flare at 6,000 metres, and then gaff at 6,400, and then Klosp will go to the deepest point, which is 7,500. What landers are, we lower it into the sea and simply let it go, uh, and it sinks by virtue of a, a sinker weight. And at full ocean depth, they'll take about three hours to crash land on the sea floor. And once they're on the sea floor, cameras roll, you know, the traps are, are luring animals in, into them, the, the environmental sensors are logging. We don't have any real control over it once it's on the sea floor, and we just let it do its thing. It sits there silently, and you get a great insight into the mobile animals that are on the sea floor. At the end of the dive, we trigger the, the jettison of the, the weight by using acoustics and it simply floats back to the surface. When it's on the surface, we can see the flag and strobes, and the ship comes alongside, we bring it on board, and then we download everything. When the landers go down, they basically, there's two functions to them. One is they have baited traps on it, so we, we collect a lot of small crustaceans, and we use those for the gene genetic and molecular studies. So we're looking at population connectivity, diversity over depth, life history, you know, bacterial stomach contents, all that kind of stuff, all that, the, the hands-on smelly stuff. And then there's the video cameras. We have HD cameras on the landers as well, and that uh, gives us an insight into the behavior of some of the bigger animals, because not, not all deep sea animals are easily trapped uh, because they have no hiding instinct, because why would you develop hiding instinct in the dark? So we have the, the, the digital data, if you like, from the video and the physical data from the, the traps. And what we found in that were a population of Mariana snailfish, which was interesting because that particular deep area is physically partitioned from the next area, which is physically partitioned from the next area. And this particular population of fish don't seem to have the capacity for going shallow enough to get from one to the other. So one of the questions we're looking at is how connected these populations really are. So this is one of the cameras that just came back and it's had water ingress which has shorted the, the power and destroyed the electronic circuit board. So we don't have any images from this particular camera. These cameras are designed to go to 11,000 meters so it's not like a, it's not the most forgiving of environments to put stuff in. Uh, and every now and again something fails. That's just the nature of the job. Uh, this one's failed quite catastrophically. I think pressure drop's unique in that it's a vessel that hasn't stopped working since it left the dock. I mean, it's done, it's been around the world, it's probably going to have been around the world twice before we're finished with it at least, and it's just a relentless workhorse. And that's where its true strength is, is having the same crew, bringing on the same people, and it's got that continuity about it that we're unstoppable. So the pressure drop's an ideal boat for this because it's built for endurance and it's quiet and our acoustic systems are, are amazing, the, the multi-beam that it has is one of the best in the world for, for mapping at these depths, and that system allows us to accurately decide where to target with the three landers. And of course, the three landers themselves are, are pretty amazing as well, and they've been deployed now over 120 times. So, so the ship is very experienced in deployment and recovery of these things, because you know, we've been doing it for a year and a half now. So it's a great vessel to work on. The first thing we do when the lander lands on deck is to shut the power down and get it on charge because it takes quite a long time to charge the battery. Scientifically, the first thing we do is take the traps off because the, the animals we collect are obviously from an environment where it's less than two degrees Celsius. Um, while the lander has been on the surface, those samples are essentially cooking, so it's a kind of race against time because the longer they're in warm water or on deck, the, the, the more the DNA starts to degrade. So we get the traps off, we empty those out, we have a quick look at what we get, if possible, we'll sort species and try and get those preserved as soon as possible. Uh, we either preserve them in what's called RNA later and put them in a minus 80 degree freezer or we preserve them in ethanol. And then once that's done, we'll strip the cameras down, take the SD cards and then the fun bit is sticking the SD card in the computer 
and having a look to see what we filmed. We catalogue every single thing in the video. The first thing we do is we assess what the seafloor looks like, so we have a, a classification for habitats. And then we look at things like the first arrival time of each species. How long after the, the, the lander landed does the first animal arrive? And from that you can make various inferences about population density. Once we have an idea of those species, we obviously try to identify them to the lowest possible taxonomic rank, which is hopefully to species level. Um, we look at uh, things like the maximum number you see at any point during the dive. So you might find that the deeper you go, the longer it takes the animal to arrive or that species to arrive, and that means that there's less and less as you go deep. And you're looking at whether or not they're eating directly on the bait, which makes them a scavenger, or, or they're quite often at the deeper sites, they wait for the small amphipods, which are small crustaceans, they wait for them to start eating the bait, and a lot of the bigger animals eat the amphipods, so they're actually predators. So you're looking at what we call uh, trophic level. We look at uh, behavioural interactions. Quite often when the big shrimp come in, you see quite a lot of animals just scattering out of the way and, and there's, there's actually a lot more going on than you think once you start to sort of really properly analyse it. So the next deep was, uh, was Rota, which is the biggest of the, the three isolated areas we've been looking at and one of the, the interesting take home from that was was again the population of snailfish so we discovered these fish about five years ago or six years ago the pretty grainy footage but it was at the time it was really quite exciting because we realized that there's this enormous population of fish living at between let's say six and a half and seven and a half thousand meters but this time we properly raised the bar so my take home from that particular area was the really high quality footage of the snailfish So the more, the Mariana Trench, the bit that people will know the most is the southern end, and that's where Challenger Deep is. Next to Challenger Deep, the Serena Deep, and there's been a lot of work done both. And there's a third one. There's a third one called Nero Deep, which is very rarely ever mentioned. Uh, and, and from a science perspective, there was, there's many reasons to go there as well, because we've already done Challenger, we've done Serena, it'd be great to complete those uh, areas. And then we we'll look at what's happening, what's changing between the, the three of them. All right, so these are, uh, a species of scavenging crustacean from the Mariana Trench. These are very common here. They're called Herendelia gigas. And when you get depth deeper than about 8,000 meters, these things are extremely dominant. These are the ones that you'll see at Challenger Deep and Serena Deep and everywhere else. The amphipod means multiple footed. So it's got four sets of legs. Under there are the swimming legs. You see them on the video, they paddle with those legs. These are their walking legs. That set there are for holding on to things, and it's got a tiny set of little legs by its mouth, which is for shoving food in its mouth. Uh, we'll preserve those in ethanol, and we'll take those back to the lab for formal identification. We do a lot of population genetic work, and pressure adaptation work, and microbiome of the stomach work, and yeah, whole manner of things you can do with these. Now we've completed 18 lander deployments across the Mariana Trench. All of the dives have been to places no one's been before, so there's great value in that. Uh, and then 24 hours later, we'll start heading north. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna head to an area called the Black Hole. Why it's called the Black Hole, I don't know, but it's an area which is quite small, quite discreet. It's right in the middle of the Philippine Basin. And the reason why we wanna look at that is because there's more, as we look around and try to avoid concentrating on the big trenches, but also include some of the smaller areas around. What we're finding is a lot of the, the animals and the species that are living in the big trenches are also present in a lot of these more subtle ge geological uh, features in between. So the black hole is right in the middle of the Philippine basin. I would be quietly confident that what we'll find in the middle of the black hole would be some sort of genetic gene floor linkages between the Mariana and the Philippine Trench and the Isabona and the Japanese Trench. It's almost like if you imagine a, a network of corridors, like a labyrinth of, of deep water features connecting these bigger areas, and that's what we want to try and test. So far on this expedition, we've mapped 25,000 square nautical miles of seafloor. We've done 18 successful dives, which amounts to about 144 hours of continuous footage. And sample-wise, we've taken thousands of individual amphipod samples, which collected in about 45 jars worth of, of samples. So it's been extremely successful. What we're doing here is, is continuing to add more and more information about 
what's happening in the deepest 45% of the oceans. Because if you, the deeper you go, the, the less and less people work there. And I think, you know, we've already achieved over 120 lander deployments in the last year and a half, just in the deepest 45%. So it's, it's a huge contribution to what was a huge void in our understanding of the oceans.